Hey there, YouTubers. It was uh, only yesterday <clears throat> that I did a fairly long video. They've been averaging <clears throat> 20 to 30 minutes, these videos. And then I do some post-production, which really takes a lot longer. Uh, in terms of just having a good rhythm, as if we were meeting every day in a regular class, right? Like, let's go back to the past. When, you know, we just show up for school and I'm like your teacher and I've got like an hour a day, really. Let's say 45 minutes and then the bell rings, you run to your locker, you've got a backpack, right? This is the old style school, not online. It's different now. You can stop the tape right now. You can go off when I say tape, obviously. I mean some file somewhere that you can pause, you can rewind. So that's what we were talking about last time, asynchronous or recently. The terms of education are going to be a lot about time, chronology. And I talked a little about main topical outline last time. The whole context of the talk was why is the geometry part so slow to make ripple effects? Like where's the corroboration in MIT technology review or wired like just some sort like a glossy centerfold about not me about the concentric hierarchy which has been around for a long time and I continue it in my curriculum along with right a lot of other stuff and of course I've been criticized you know the math teaching world is quite contentious and I was on Math Teach at the Math Forum for about 10 years, and, you know, I was getting flogged by this or that person, right? So it's not like, I'm not saying I came out all victorious and vanquished my opposition. What really happened is that whole discussion list got wiped off the internet, right? That was the Math Forum. Maybe it will come back, and I do have an archives, like, of a lot of it. It's going to be a message coming in on Facebook. So yesterday, in my time, in my chronology, it was yesterday, I was hovering over a fairly old hand-coded web page from ages ago. I call it the 1990s, but, you know, some of this stuff I was, I've been working on steadily. Incommensurability. See, I didn't scroll down this far last time. But that's the same tension that the Greeks discovered in discovering that uh, the second root of two could not be expressed as any P over Q, where P and Q are integers. The whole idea that real numbers has to include the second root of two, but it's not what we'd call rational. So the irrational numbers, that whole, that whole it's interesting how psychology and mathematics kind of overlap their turns, terms and there's some kind of discomfort about it. Like you'll get a lot of mathematicians saying uh, the, the way we use imaginary, and I was looking at that too, we were talking about bases and complex numbers and stuff. Um, yep, Facebook's talking. Let's see. Not to lose my train of thought. You know how I go. I'm waiting for this to load, actually. I'm just untitled. Oh, there it is. It's there. So the complex numbers I was showing last time are like a set that doesn't have ordering implemented, greater or less than. It doesn't have any real meaning to use those symbols. And yet we still have field group properties, right? So ordering, when does ordering become important in terms of group ring and field? Can we get all the way to field and yet still greater than, less than symbols don't really have any meaning? Okay, those kinds of interesting questions. So incommensurability is part of this outline. All this stuff, in other words, is very conventional. Let us let me put it that way. And when I show you sort of my bookshelf, like at the uh, opening web page for the school, you know, there's Midat Gazale, Egyptian heritage, similar to, uh, in terms of being Egyptian heritage, uh, the, the, uh, the uh, what's his name, 
Cuisinart guy. He he didn't invent the Cuisinart rods, but he used them to teach algebra. He had like an algebra first approach with, you know, with ordinary uh, kids. He could get them to really go far. Gategno, Caleb Gategno, right? Big kind of founded the equivalent of the NCTM in the UK, you could say. So I'm familiar with the education, uh, you know, authors probably more than you think I am sometimes. But anyway, moving on down, I just wanted to mention Gazale there. He's also going to be good on mixed bases and half adders and all kinds of stuff. So what I'm saying here is a lot of my my curriculum is the normal stuff, what you'd be expecting in 21st century. Uh, it's very mainstream already, right? The stuff I'm talking about, I take issue with, like in the math forum where that 10 years of writing got deleted or whatever, lost, no longer public. So I can't show you, you know, where I talk and keep my ground with all these different professors or whatever, it's not really about this material, right? We all agree that it's important to integrate math and computer science. This is stuff about how a website is designed and so forth. So I'm all into melding SQL, HTML, CSS, all that kind of stuff. It's just more everyday high school math, right? It's actually communication skills. You could teach HTML, CSS under grammar and punctuation as an extension of English or whatever language you're using, Unicode. And that was Gene Fowler's approach, a poet I knew. He wrote a book called Waking the Poet, Gene Fowler. And his thing was, yeah, uh, let's treat HTML and all that markup stuff as English, as grammar, as what you learn in the humanities, right? And here, double-clicking, showing markdown, you know, is this math, is this STEM, the fact that I put three um, hash octothorps in front of something to make a certain size of, you know, heading, all that, I would say, no, that's, that's kind of um, more like spelling and grammar and, right? So school has been under pressure. The future shock thing was real, the Alvin Toffler statement that, you know, we're going to be accelerating here. That all panned out for sure in spades. And so now it's like your school has got this job that it doesn't maybe know how to do or maybe does. But how is it going to get you into HTML and all that by high school? Are they going to call that computer science and oppose that to math or make it different than math and stuff? And how are they going to do it? And the thing is, these questions are debated, they're not settled. Like, people wade in with different ideas all the time, and here's me being one of those people. Like, I'm not common core, right? And I'm not really exactly new math, because that was back in the 60s, and a lot has, has changed. So what you teach the next generation, you don't carve it in stone. We have to give that up. It's always morphing. And so a big job of every generation is to recast the curriculum, recast all the institutions to some degree, including schools where we're doing more with, uh, with uh, the Internet. But there's a lot of stuff you can't learn online, obviously, right? Like I'm going to be learning how to drive a truck, let's say. It doesn't have to be an electric truck. This is the Truckers for Peace program I talk about. I'm always, you know, I've got the Truckers Without Borders kind of plan. Just truckers now. If you're just joy driving, you get in line and wait for customs. I'm just kidding. I'm not in charge, okay? I'm just trying to. But I want to lower the, the waiting times for busy truckers trying to earn a living, having to sit at a border. There's something hypocritical about saying, oh, you're for open borders, as if it's a horrible, horrible thing. And yet that's the primary attraction of being in the, quote, United States, especially lower 48, is open borders, right? We love that. And if Mexico was a wonderful place in our minds, our minds being the lower 48ers, we'd love to just keep on driving south without queuing 
you know, if everybody could drive everywhere, that sounds kind of like heaven and some heaven. But um, truckers deserve it, and the rest of us don't. I'm just saying, if you know, if I'm a cult leader in the trucking world, it's like truckers rule. Okay, and I don't even drive a truck yet, but let's say I want to. I'm not going to do it on the internet here. I'm not going to. I can do truck simulations. Now there's a lot I can do, actually, and I have done because I trucking software. I've watched over the shoulder of a master. Not wasn't self-driving trucks. That was routing and stuff like that. Transportation engineering, not directly my field, but you can get there from graph theory. Okay. So as I scroll through this, I just want to emphasize the non-controversialness of it all. Like 99% of what I'm purveying and have been purveying for 20, 30 years is extremely accepted already. And there, there's the big, there's my outline. Now, if each one of these were a link, that'd be great. And if I'd written whole textbooks about all this, that'd be even greater. And of course, no, very finite over here. I switched to Jupyter Notebooks at some point as a primary publishing uh, technique, but, you know, I love, I love HTML still. I think we should all use all the tools we have, right? I'm not on any, like, uh, soapbox about how everybody has to do everything, right? What I am on a soapbox about is, okay, we'll go back to the computer resources. Remember last time I was talking about this is where most people probably are looking for stuff because that's where I've got all my Python filed together, all kinds of stuff. But what I really focus on a lot, and which is unusual, is the way we, we introduce geometry. And I just want to find my numeracy and computer literacy series and explain quickly about the four pages that are here and suggest, hey, this is good structuring content for whatever you're doing. This is what we'd call scaffolding. And it does hinge around having some kind of ray tracer. Now, this could all be done in Blender, I'm thinking. So what I did with POV Ray and continue to have available here, this, this pretty much still works. It's Python 2.7-ish. Look at that, Python 1.5.2. So this is like amazingly old now. It starts to look like it's uh, cave paintings or something. But I, I'm introducing some basic series and sequences, which is what computer programming is really good for, because you got one-liners. You know, when you write <coughs> computer programs, quote-unquote, you're writing a one- or two-line thing. You're barely above the level of a calculator. <clears throat> but you're starting all this right brain stuff. You're thinking about, you know, all this imagery. You've got the geometry going. You don't have to wait till you get to XYZ coordinates before you start stacking balls and start having like a growing pyramid of balls. You can do that well before XYZ, right, or any kind of coordinates. So I'm just saying where to bring in geometry in connection with mathematics is with figure it and polyhedral numbers, right? Growing what, what Midhad calls, Midhad Gazale calls the nomen with a G, right? Or no G. Yeah, G, right? So, yeah, uh, book of numbers, Conway and Guy, same thing, right? So, again, nothing all, this is all what mathematicians are into anyway. I don't think anything I've said so far is very controversial. And the fact that the cube octahedral numbers are the same as the icosahedral numbers, you can show that with what we call a jitterbug transformation. Right? You've seen this a million times, so let me get it here on the screen. Let's get all, let's get the spheres and let's get the, the thing. This is the part this controversial. It's like, oh, no, 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 we can't teach this. We can't actually have a teacher in the front of the classroom doing this with this particular artifact sold as the vector flexor. And for 20, 30, 40 years, that has been our decision. Now I'm going to stand for some powder wig or something, some bureaucrat somewhere. Our decision is this this kind of math that you're starting to stray into here is not 
allowed. Okay, verboten, we call it. That's the title of my previous video, verboten math. And that's because in that math, these rhombic dodecahedra, which fill space according to a certain sequence and so forth, are volume six. And how did we get to that? And wouldn't that mean the sphere itself had a different volume? And doesn't that change all the volume formulas? And who's going to ever want to do that? And the point is you don't do that. The point is you keep everything exactly the way it is, a la Wittgenstein, right? Philosophy. My aim here is to keep everything intact, basically, he said. There's nothing that needs to be changed. And that's that what we, we can take that attitude towards everything that we have, and still we can say, oh, and by the way, there's this interesting sort of side trip we can take, and we can even say into American literature, if we want to, like, contain it, right? And there we will encounter the whole number of volumes based on the tetrahedron as unit volume. In its nice own little park, you could call it sweet little hedges all trimmed in fountains, and it's just like a secret garden or whatever, and it's not disruptive at all, right? So part two. This is where, where you're going to want to... I used to have a Java applet here in Java that had a cube rotating because of the quaternions, and then I wrote this whole little library <clears throat> based on quaternions and so on and whatever. But that's too, too, I don't think we get into that very deeply at first, right? We're just introducing the vector concept. And this is where later in the curriculum, because this was back in early 2000s or the 90s, we developed the Quadre coordinate system. And it writes the same POV ray output, or it writes to, or it's in Blender nowadays. But you, it's not either or, by the way. It'd be real fun to use POV ray pretty much the way we're doing, with string substitution. So all the math is in Python or the computer language of your choice, Ruby. And then you print out uh, the scene description language ready to be fed to POV Ray. And out comes all this stuff. Now, we can do this in a variety of tools. But I find it empowering, at least, to do it in one tool and have it the, 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 the students save their work, their, their art, and they can use their art going forward. You're building a collection of art you generated, you did, means stuff to you, and you can use it in your own projects, no questions asked, that kind of thing, right? The power to build a portfolio, right? So I'm demonstrating, again, my portfolio, and I'm saying, hey, fun way to go. Get some kind of ray tracing hooked up to your evolving concept of XYZ coordinates. And forget about quad rays. Just, and you don't need to teach it all twice, right? It's like they teach XYZ and then they teach it again with vectors. It's like a vector is a math object. Get the math objects in there and I say get dot notation in there. I would say instead of saying it's math versus computer science, it's math accepts the dot operator by which I mean the accessor in object-oriented terms. I can hear people freaking out because they don't like object-oriented terms. But now we're getting esoteric again. So third part and fourth part, and then we're done here. We're just going deeper into a website that's been here for a while, since the 1990s, late 1990s, shortly after the web was invented and made accessible. I start putting this stuff on Python's way back in version 1.5 and we're getting into Pascal's triangle big time and remember sphere packing you can do it with the Pascal's triangle it's kind of like the book of numbers by Conway and Guy again check that title right this is your math education right so do it the way you want to do it but I'm telling you packing spheres and uh, studying um, what, what are we doing getting into prime numbers here okay I continue these themes into the future this is the 1990s now we do things like this in Jupyter notebooks this is older Python probably still runs I'm more giving you um, a stash pile of ideas and leaving it up to you to update your knowledge if you don't. Like we've got RSA was already a public algorithm at that point. 
There's already been a lot of fights about how much cryptography to make public. Basically, the commercial sector needed a way to have instant, anonymous, or shall we say, unbreakable transactions. Let's put it that way. Private between two people. That's a pattern that goes way back, right? In the old souk or the, the old bazaars, they used to have a way, a sort of finger language, where you could put a, a blanket or cloak over the, the, the two people would look, hold hands or like touch fingers and do all this negotiation and no one could see under the cloak what they were agreeing to. So I'm told, pretty cool, can understand the need for it. That's encryption. So we're building up to, or that's a hidden communication channel, it might as well be encryption. Could call it encryption. The difference between encryption and encoding is extremely thin, right? So we, we bring in a lot of color. What I don't have a lot of in this curriculum is sound and music and stuff. And that is something I talk a lot about, but you're not going to find a huge amount of wonderful um music stuff here. So that was getting inventive with vectors and then comes the random walks part. And if you've been watching a recent video of mine, the one let's say two or three back, about random walks in the IVM, basically we take and generalize the two-dimensional sphere packing here and let the random walks begin say from the same center, we could say like the lamppost random walk in 12 around one CCP hood and get to wherever you get, make a tetrahedron and then measure its volume in terms of the unit tetrahedron that connects any four balls that are intertangent, right? So we're introducing a lot more randomness, randomness and so forth. It was after this in time and getting into more continuity of graphing higher, higher frequencies, right? as we approach the calculus and so on, there is going to be calculus, right? We're going to get to that. Again, I was a calculus teacher and I'm not anti-calculus. Some things that maybe you hear me say, but no, I'm just saying, you know, there is another track that we could pioneer through high school called Lambda versus Delta calculus that would have more of what I'm showing you, basically. We called it digital math at one point. And I'm like saying any given student is not restricted to one or the other. It's not either or. It's more a matter of structuring and taking what we called computer science and just allowing it to be one of the STEMs, S-T-E-M. It could be all of them, right? Science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. There's no reason for computer science to add, add a letter to that and say, get like, oh, you left us out. No, you're pervasive through all of that. Science, technology, engineering, mathematics, of course that fits, computer science fits. But we can just, you know, keep calling STEM, STEM. And then, as you know, I kind of come from the path side, philosophy, anthropology, theater, and history. Politics equals theater. History, um, you know, there's other ways you might want to break it down, but works for me, right? It's kind of Hegelian logic and history. STEM and path. And philosophy is the unifier. Notice we're kind of keeping this st secular. I haven't, even in going into American transcendentalism in path, which is where we go when we start doing all this jitterbug stuff, where'd it go? I think why the math people don't want to have this in front of the math classroom is because it's coming too much from the literature community, right? This is coming from like um, Hugh Kenner and Ezra Poundy. It's kind of too much humanities and they're therefore fine. Let's just do it there. Let's take all this that I've shown you, and we'll just take it on into philosophy. As, you know, you don't, if you're a math person, don't worry about any of this. It's not your problem. We can handle it from here, if that's the way people want to go, right? So we can talk. Let's see. We're pretty much done here. I just wanted to give you an overview of what we have inside 
the actual 4D solutions, what you call it, um, Oregon Curriculum Network website. Yeah, I've made hundreds of videos, but I haven't really taken the time to delve into what I actually have here. So I thought now with the benefit of YouTube and the ability to narrate my own websites, it's a good time. I'll talk to you about more of all this in the near future.